Hey everybody, Dave Clark, aka the Pattern Guy here again. Um, this week I'm going to show you some hand tools that we use specifically for pattern making. Um, like I said, I do things old school, everything's by hand. I do have a CNC machine that's not working. But um, still do everything old school. I want to teach you the old school method. Um, one of the points being I talked about my old foreman, old German guy. Uh, when I was an apprentice, we used to make what's called boards for the patterns, cope and drag boards. And all we did was we took two inch thick mahogany out of the lumber rack, ran them across the planer, put them down on our bench, put battens across them, flipped them. Well, they're not flat. So in pattern making, everything's going to be perfectly flat. So we had a big machine, it's called a pattern mill. The older guys would take their boards over the pattern mill and surface everything nice and flat. Well, Joe, the old German guy, used to make me take out the joiner hand plane, okay? And what we used to do is we used to grab a flat board, like a stick, put chalk on it, rub that board wherever the chalk hit, and I'll show you this down the road, we'll do one. You know, you start hand planing it. And it, it took, you know, decided depending on how big the boards were, it would take anywhere from half an hour up to a couple hours to do them. And uh, the other guys on the machines, old guys, they would be there for, you know, 10 minutes and, and they're done. But Joe used to make me do them by hand through my whole apprenticeship. And I'm glad he did because what happens in here, I don't have a big pattern mill to do it. So if I have to make a board, I got to do it by hand in here. And that's the same thing with you guys starting out in that. You have to do a lot of stuff by hand. So we'll teach you how to use your hand tools. All right. So these things, you know, all your hand planes and at a lot of places you can find these in garage sales, uh, flea markets. And they a lot of people just hang these things on the wall. They don't think people use them anymore, but we use them still in pattern making. A lot of guys getting big again in woodworking and that, and furniture making and that, but we use them in pattern making, all right? So look around for, um, you know, your hand plays. Like I said, this one's a joiner. It's called a joiner, all right? Then you go down a little bit. Some people call this the number five, or a lot of people call it a jack plane, okay? That one's... It's a little bit step down from the, the joiner as far as getting bigger parts, man. All right, now this is a smooth plane. This will get a little more fine for you. And then over here we have, this is the block plane. These come in handy for powder makers a lot because you always have to round corners off in that and you can use your hand plane. Um, big ones to get, this is a record. Uh, records, really, really good tools. Um, Stanley. Bailey, that's another good one. So if you see these in a garage sale, you know, pick them up for 10, 20 bucks, 30 bucks, you know, I, I get them. Uh, there's lots of videos out on the internet, um, guys that specifically will get like an old hand plane, retune it, sharpen it, watch those videos. I'm not gonna waste your guys' time. Well, you waste my time. I wanna teach you pattern making. So. Learn that kind of stuff from other guys. Um, you'd learn it a lot better from them anyhow, too. Um, if you can find one of these, believe it or not, this is called a brace and bit. I, you know, if you see these, uh, use the Amish guys use these a lot. They'll put the big spade bits in, in that. Um, I've, got, I've got a screwdriver bit in this. And, yeah, you have... Um, screw guns, I use a screw gun mostly, but every once in a while I get an old pattern in here that I got to take apart. And it's slotted screws, and it, it's, they're just too big for the screw guns to, to unscrew. So I believe it or not, I use this a lot, okay? And next thing you need, to, one of the biggest things you need in powder making, when we're building a pattern, the first thing we do is we get the drawing and we get a sheet of plywood and we make what's called a layout. So we basically redraw the 
pattern on a piece of wood. The reason we do that is when you make a casting, when they pour the metal, when it solidifies, it shrinks. So we have to add shrinkage in so the drawing doesn't have shrinkage on it. So we redraw it with our shrinkage plus machining. There's a lot of times where, you know, a casting's got to be machined. So we know where the machining is and that on there when we um, lay it out. What will happen is if I make the pattern exactly to the drawing, they cast it, send it to the machine shop, they start trying to machine. There's not extra stock on there to machine off. So we have to build in extra stock and I'll show you, you know, some layouts later. Um, as far as shrinkage goes, one of the biggest things in pattern making, okay, what we do is use what's called a shrink rule. This is a shrink rule. This is a standard rule, all right? Every metal shrinks differently. Uh, cast iron we use. Cast iron shrinks one eighth per foot. Um, aluminum, if I do an aluminum pattern, I use a 3 16 shrink rule. Okay, it shrinks 3 16 of an inch um, per foot. Okay, so this one is 9 30 second. That's uh, if you heard last week, I talked about a master pattern. So, what we have to do if you make an aluminum pattern, it's got to be double shrink. So, what it'll do is I'll make it out of the 9 30 second shrink rule. When they make the aluminum match plate, that'll shrink. And then after that, you have your shrinkage for your cases on the road. But here's a standard 12 inch. I don't know if we'll be able to see this on the board, but you can see how this one's 9 30 seconds taller than that one. So this has my built in shrinkage in it. So when I'm doing a pattern that needs 9 30 second shrink, this is all I use right here. I don't use a standard ruler. Okay, so and I've got bunch of different, you know, I've got 8, 3 16, 5 30 seconds, 9 30 seconds, and they're all for the different metals, okay? While you're doing your layout, pattern makers, we do not use pencils when we're making our lines when we're laying things out, okay? We use a knife, okay? This one my dad actually made me the first day I went out uh, for my apprenticeship, the first day in the shop, my dad used to work midnights at Ford, so he got home, he's in the driveway, I was getting ready to leave for work, he's like, hey, come here. He goes, hey, I made you a marking knife. It, it was a little bit longer, this has been around for almost 40 years. So, um, my dad made me this marking my layout knife, uh, you know, when I was an apprentice. So what we do with that is, um, when you're buying your tools, we need a combination square. Um, look for your layout equipment, um, your precision tools, buy nicer, better quality tools. Uh, most of my stuff is Sterrett. This is a Sterrett combination square. Okay. Um, I've got a 24 inch one here for bigger patterns. Um, they still make these, I believe. Um, I got a small one on this one. Usually I use a lot for machine stuff and that. but. What you want to do is get quality. Uh, Brown and Sharp makes good ones also. Uh, believe it or not, moving you know this blade in and out a lot. Um, I actually wore my first head. This is called the head. This is called the blade. All right. I actually wore my first head out that I, I bought when I was uh, when I was going through machine trades in high school. I bought a tool kit. They had a Starrett combination square in there. And over the years, running it in and out, taking my blade in and out, um, you take them out. This is a protractor. We need these uh, for powder making. Like I told you, we need to put draft angles on there. So you need your protractor. Um, when I first started doing uh, powder making, I had the one blade. I had the protractor head, the square head, and another one that's called a centering head. It's V-shaped. So you can put it over a cylinder to get the center on it. So I only had one blade, so if I wanted to use a protractor, I'd have to take the blade out, put it in the protractor. So in, in doing that, taking it in and out, I wore my head out. So, you know, you don't want to get some cheap, you know, square from Home Depot. It's important that you do things to do them square, okay? So spend a little bit more money on your precision equipment. 
All right, um, these are dividers, not compass. It's a bigger pair, smaller pair. Um, a lot of times, same thing. You find these in garage sales. People don't know what they are. Um, you know, flea markets and that. A compass has a point in a pencil. These have two points on them, okay? So when you're doing your layout, you can get your center point and then you scribe just like we're using a knife, okay? Um, this this one to do big circles, actually this is called, um, oh, it popped out of my head. My, I'll tell you in a second. My dad actually made these uh, when he was an apprentice in that, in, um, you know, they've been around for, for quite a while. So I use these in uh, trammel points, it just popped in my head again. Um, these are called trammels. So my dad made these. Um, you can actually get the uh, scribes separate and then what you can do is you'll put a board in them and make them so that you can you can do like six eight foot circles beyond that the board starts flexing so it's it's, it's kind of hard but you know these are nice he made a nice steel rod so then for doing parallel lines on your layout or on your patterns and that instead of measuring from your edge up 10 inches from your edge 10 inches and scribe a line we have what's called this is a thumb gauge, some guys call it a marking gauge. Okay, so this will rest on your square edge and then this end will mark. Um, say it, this one's a little bigger, uh, panel gauge. Okay, I'm gonna make a bigger one out of wood. So maybe we'll do that as a project down the road and uh, make a nice maple uh, panel gauge, okay, the big ones. Then we go to our real precision equipment this definitely, you want to get stirred, brown and sharp. Uh, Mitsutoyo, you know, they, they do good stuff. I have a couple of theirs also, but I, I'd rather do the stir and, and brown and sharp in that. So, um, micrometers. And, and here's the thing. I'm going to teach you as much as I know. I've been in this field for forever, for a long time, almost 40 years professionally. Okay. Uh, I thought I know everything. Uh, I still learn things. I'll be on YouTube and, and, and learn new things and that. So actually there's a young girl real quick. Uh, I'm going to ramble real quick here. Um, I was on a couple of weeks ago. Okay. And a young girl, she, she has a channel. She does uh, projects and she self-taught everything self-taught. She started a, a, a YouTube channel and that. So she had one of her videos was about tape measures. I'm like, yeah. Uh, I know everything there is about that. I've been doing this. Nobody can teach me, you know, pointers on tape measures. So she had 10 different little pointers. Four of them I didn't know. I, I was embarrassed, okay? So back to the precision equipment, okay? I've been in this trade for, like I said, close to 40 years professional. I've never seen this small set of micrometers. My dad just happened. I was over my dad's a few months ago. He pulled these out of a drawer. I've never seen a micrometer that small, but it's pretty cool. So these are micrometers. Okay, these go, believe it or not, you can do feet with these things. They've got different sizes of them, okay? Um, usually you get, I've got to set like one inch to six inches. That usually suffices. All right, then you get calipers. These are dial calipers. Um, they obviously have a dial on them. These are what's called vernier calipers, okay? There's no dial on them. Uh, nowadays they have digital ones in that. These actually just have increments. And one, one day we'll show you how to read these because uh, these actually have the increments on them. Like, you know, we'll have to teach you how to read, read the micrometers too. It's a little bit of a trick to these, you know, same thing with these. Thing with these versus your dial, okay? My first, First place of employment, uh, man, so we're for precision mold and pan. I gotta clarify this too. We are attached to Arrow Aluminum. I always just say Arrow Aluminum. Arrow was owned by the brother. Precision was owned by the sister. I actually work for Precision. I always just say Arrow Aluminum. We had a mold shop and we had a wood pattern shop. I used to work in the mold shop a lot because I knew how to run all the machines in there. If they needed an extra guy, I'd, I'd go run over there if we were in a pattern shop. Uh, slow in a pattern shop, you know, we'd go over there. Um, the machine shop boss over there, he would not let you use dial calipers or, you know, they were just starting to get into the digital because his belief was 
every once in a while you'll see too that the dial kind of gets out of sync a little bit so you're not doing correct measurements right so with these verniers there is no way for you to do that i mean that's what it measures that, that you're going to measure okay so he's a little stickler on that but, uh, dials are fine you can, there's other ways you can check things and that so um, another thing we use a lot is chisels and gouges um the second place I worked at, the guy wanted us to use die grinders all the time. Um, old German guy, you know, you get a die grinder out to die grind wood or a file. He'd be, oh, you know, there's a thousand pattern makers rolling over in their graves, you using that. Um, the second guy I worked for, he believed that you could remove stock quicker with a die grinder and a sander pad on it. I agree with sometimes you can. Um, there are other times if you learn how to sharpen your chisels, gouges, and hand planes and that really good and that's the key. Um, there again, there's a ton of guys out on, uh, on YouTube that, that have awesome sharpening uh, lessons and that do, do those guys because mine I don't sharpen that, you know, that much. I don't carve a lot, okay? So learn how to sharpen from those guys. But anyhow, a lot of times I could really take off with a good sharp gouge or a good sharp chisel, I could take more stock off than a die grinder can really quick. And we actually made the, the guy a bet and I, I beat him. So he let me keep my chisels and gouges. So anyhow, I, I'm not gonna go over all the chisels and gouges. This is one of my favorite. This actually belonged to my great grandfather. Okay, so this chisel's probably over 100, it's way over 100 years old, okay, it's called a paring chisel, this is one of my most go-to chisels I have, okay, one of the things is, if you find chisels and gouges, again, look for quality, old Sheffield steel, if you see Sheffield on the label, get it, Sheffield, England, they made the best tool steel in the world for the longest time, the old ones, they're not around anymore. I heard they're coming back, but I'm not sure. But if you can find old chisel or gouge with Sheffield on it, snatch that up real quick. See how long this is? Uh, most of my other chisels and that, they're shorter. The reason this one's longer, and it's 100 years old, I barely ever have to sharpen this. This thing holds an edge like you wouldn't believe. All right, so chisel, you know, it's got a flat edge. Then we have our gouges, the gouges, actually have a concave, con <laughs> they're concave, okay? So you can get into, you know, concave surfaces. All different kinds of sizes, shapes, different radiuses. Uh, I, I literally probably chisels and gouges, uh, I've got probably a couple hundred, you know, I barely, you know, I got those behind here, that's ones that, that I use mostly. Um, this is straight shank, you got a crank shank. This actually, uh, you can get into places a lot better. So it's, it's nice to have, you know, the different varieties. I mean, if you can pick them up for 10, 20 bucks in a garage sale, snag them. Um, Buck Brothers, older Buck Brothers are real good here. Um, this is Stanley. Stanley, um, they make fairly good quality. This is more for carpenters and, and that. It's got a steel end on it, you can beat it, but I, you know, every once in a while, I'll, I'll use the older, or the, you know, I'll use these ones. I call these beater chisels in that. But it's, uh, you know, spend your money. If you can find good quality, um, you know, your squares, layout equipment, you know, your verniers and, and, and that. And then, you know, for like, I don't know, like I said, like the one chisel, the beater chisels, you know, you can just pick up anything you got. Hammers. Um, all that kind of stuff. I like Vaughn hammers. I, I used to do carpentry a lot. Vaughn makes really good hammers. Um, and I'm speaking all these different name brands, okay? I don't get paid for any of this stuff. This is equipment I've been using for the, you know, 40 plus years I've been doing this. So it's, I'm just telling you what I use, what I've had good luck with, what other people have used in that. And, uh, you know, the better things. And if I say something, I did say, you know, Grizzly doesn't make good equipment. They, they make good equipment, but it's not something that I, I, I wouldn't, you know, if I could get into a bigger shop, which I, I want to eventually, you know, I want to have all nicer equipment in that. 
yeah, they make fine stuff, good stuff to get started in, but it's, uh, like I said, it's just, it's lower quality, it is. It's not gonna last you as long. Um, you know, you want, like my joiner over there, that's, what, almost 100 years old. And, and that's probably the best machine in the shop here. So you wanna get good quality things that'll last you. And, uh, yeah, I wanna get into political stuff, but too, get, get stuff, you're getting into the manufacturing business Get stuff that's made in this country as much as you can, you know, because you're just going to keep yourself in, in business a little bit longer in that. And, and that's, I will not want to do the politic thing, but, you know, you want to, you know, try to keep yourself in business doing this stuff. So um, that's a lot of the hand tools we're using. I'll start getting into making some patterns and that, and, and then we'll go over, you know, a little bit more how we use them and, and things like that. So... Uh, till the next video, and everybody have a good one out there.